Good morning. Welcome to our service this morning. If you'd like, you can turn in your hymnals to 111. And can it be, stand and sing with me this morning. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Let's stand as we sing. Father's Day to our fathers. We'll be singing a little bit more about that a little bit later, but let's uh, thank the Lord that uh, we can, as those ones that our sin pursued Christ to his death, uh, but yet we stand and can now boldly approach the throne and uh, cry out in our sin and our need, Abba, Father. And so what a privilege to be a child of God. And it was our sin that nailed him to that cross. I trust we're humble this morning and the gift of eternal life and salvation that God has provided through his son. Father, again, we come to you and thank you again for just the grace and humility that we need to bring in our lives back to you and just pray that you'll help us to, again, count it this day a great privilege to be called your children and to be able to call you our father. And through the gift of your son, we thank you for being part of your family. And Lord, we thank you for the eternal family that we will enjoy in your presence, in the presence of your Son, the Spirit of God. And we give praise and thanks to you. As we gather here together this morning, we again pray that our hearts will be knit to worship you in spirit and in truth now, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, just a couple of things to mention. Uh, today is Father's Day Baby Bottle Blast. I see a lot of the uh, baby bottles for the Capital Area Pregnancy Center back there. We had about uh, 65 to 70 folks take those with you on Mother's Day, and today's the day you're to bring them back with your donation. If by chance you forgot, you can also just continue to bring them back, place them on the table there, and we make, we'll make sure that they get there to the Capital Area Pregnancy Center. Well, VBS will be starting uh, this coming week, and, uh, and uh, if you've been in the fellowship hall, you've seen a lot of the work that's been done by Pastor Tim and those that are helping him, and I think the young people will have an enjoyable time together. Uh, you'll be having a workers' orientation tomorrow evening at 6.30 just to make sure all the details as much as possible as you talk about VBS are covered and prepared for, and, uh, and so that is tomorrow, the orientation, and the VBS will start from... Uh, uh, 6.30 on the 22nd to the 25th, Tuesday through Friday with a special event for families and on Friday evening. And so if you uh, didn't pick up maybe an invitation here to invite somebody, you can do that. And, uh, and so just to mention that, there will be a penny offering. Maybe Pastor Tim can say a little bit about that if we have time. Uh, he'll say something about that, uh, I'm sure, with his workers. Um, as it relates to VBS, 
Uh, we're going to change in the breeze up. They're going to change our Sunday format a little bit for next Sunday. We have two challenges facing us, and so we want to get the facility ready. I was thinking about this last night around 1130, 12 o'clock. Um, and so uh, we need to get the facility ready for Sunday morning. We were going to have a work day to get the facility back in order on the afternoon of next Sunday. But really, uh, the main priority is to get the facility back and ready to go uh, for Sunday morning. Our Sunday school classes, the fellowship hall, and those types of things. Uh, this, the facility takes quite a beating during VBS. There's a lot of bodies going around here. And so we need to get that priority of Sunday morning. And so maybe you're not working in VBS this week, throughout the week, because by the end of the week, those workers are pretty weary. And uh, to stay after for another hour or so on a Friday night is a challenge for them as they've been serving all week. And so maybe you're not working throughout the week in VBS, but you'd be willing to come on Friday evening around 8 o'clock and just help us with just either some cleaning, wiping things down, those types of things. Ladies could do that, uh, you know, just uh, sweeping floors, wiping some things down uh, in the kitchen, classrooms, restrooms, those types of things. And if there are some men that can just help move desks and chairs back in the classrooms that we're using in this wing as far as uh, Sunday school classes for our children on Sunday morning and so we're kind of limited in our staff this coming weekend that aren't available and so it's uh, we just need some extra help and so there's a sign-up sheet back there that was related to Sunday but we'll just kind of tweak it and make it for Friday night if you could arrive around 8 about 9 o'clock you should be done that'll get our facility in place generally for Sunday morning uh, the the, the, the pirate ship that's in the uh, fellowship hall will wait till uh, uh, Trent returns back so he can help dismantle that and we'll put it back. It's quite, it's uh, pretty extensive. And so if you could help with that, that would be a big help as it relates to that. And then uh, because of that, that opens up Sunday evening, but I'll be out of town and some of our other men that typically fill the pulpit are not available. And so we'll have something in here on Sunday evening because the fellowship hall will not be available again on the 27th because of the pirate ship that's in there. So uh, we're limited on that as well on preaching staff and those that typically fill the pulpit. So on Sunday evening, the 27th, we'll watch a front line uh, dispatches from the front video that we enjoy. And so that's our plan. And if that changes, I'll let you know. But we have to get the facility in order generally for Sunday morning of the 27th. So if you can help with that, please sign up. Uh, deacon nominations, if you'd like to nominate a deacon, please email me or see give that to one of our current deacons by Sunday, July 4th, if you would please. Uh, Sunday, July 11th is baptismal service. We have a number of young people that are asking or requesting to be baptized. If you'd like to be baptized, please see me personally by July 7th so we can make preparation for that. For tonight, uh, our study in Psalms, Psalm 135. You can pick up a study sheet if you haven't done so already on the Welcome Center there. And we'll be meeting in here again because, again, the, the Fellowship Hall just does not have the accessibility for, for those number of folks. And so that reminder to you as well. Okay? All right. Uh, good to have Patsy Moyer. Hi, Patsy. Good to have you back. And uh, so say hi to Patsy, if you would, please. <clears throat> Just a card of thanks from uh, George and Deb Oman. Uh, Homan, thank you so much for your calls, cards, and meals. George seems to be improving daily. We are so very blessed. God bless you all. And so they're very thankful for your prayers and concerns. Thank you for your giving to TAP, the Tuition Assistance Program for Heritage Christian Academy, either by pledge or by offering. And you'll see the total there of, uh, to date of pledges and offering. If you'd like to continue to give, of course you can do that throughout the year by designating your offering. Or the pledge cards are available still in the credenza there in the foyer for you to fill out if you'd like to turn in a pledge card if you were not here uh, last Lord's Day. Uh, thank you as well for your generosity for our young people to be able to go to the wilds of North Carolina. They'll be leaving next week, uh, late Sunday night, early Sunday morning. And so we praise the Lord for that opportunity. And because of your giving, that's able to supplement their cost. Uh, parents, your remaining balance is $185. And so thank you again for those church members that so generously give to our young people that have this opportunity for the Lord to work and speak in their lives. One prayer request for my brother-in-law, Greg Mills, in Kansas City. He's been suffering the, from some physical needs in the hospital this past week, hopefully discharged today after uh, numerous tests and just adjusting of medications. And I would appreciate your prayers for my brother-in-law, Greg. Men, you come. We'll take our morning tithes and offerings. Lord, we thank you and praise you again that we can come to you in our time of need. And Lord, what a thought that we as broken people can come before the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 
We pray as that publican stood before you there in the temple and would not even lift his head but beat upon his breast and cried out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We pray that will be our heart. We would see ourselves as broken and, and uh, just uh, separated and uh, condemned, but yet we, we don't live in that reality any longer in Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And we thank you again that uh, uh, to, uh, to have faith in your son is to have eternal life and uh, to have a, a new standing, a new relationship, a, a new opportunity uh, of glorifying you in our lives. We thank you for your commitment to us to finish that good work that began uh, at that point of trust and dependence upon Christ. That, Lord, you're still working in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. We can't do it on our own. We need your Spirit's work. We need the Word of God to prompt us. We need fellow believers to exhort us into love and to good works. And so we're dependent upon all these things to be what you would have us to be that we might glorify you. We thank you for Patsy being here this morning. It's been a long number of months for her and others in our church ministry. We pray for your continued encouragement upon those that are, that are still uh, at a stage or circumstance of life that would limit their involvement with, with the body of Christ. We pray for your encouragement in their lives and, and in their families. Uh, we just pray that you would just and thank you for the generosity of this church as it relates to that uh, next generation in the giving of these funds to the tuition assistance program in our academy. Father, may we be good stewards of not these funds only, but of these lives and of these families, we pray. We thank you for the young people that will be going to camp and those that will be taking them. We pray, Father, you'll do great things through the word of God and the spirit of God and your commitment to your children. And Lord, I pray for my brother-in-law that you would just help him and be gracious in raising him up with the right diagnosis and treatment that will be beneficial to him. And Father, we pray for your, just that good transition back to his home. Lord, we again, as we gather around your word and song today, we thank you for the privilege of worship through your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
just want to share uh, about the VBS offering Pastor mentioned this year. Each year we try to um, get a project that we can use the VBS offering for and something that the kids can get excited about as they uh, give toward that. And we know it's actually you giving toward that, but the kids enjoy buying the bricks and, and bringing the pennies. But this year uh, we're going to be giving the offering to uh, Robbie Ascension at Lighthouse Baptist. Uh, he had a project um, that he said... Uh, he would really appreciate some help with, and that's a food bank that they have started. And the way it works is they invite folks uh, in need to come to their church, and they share the gospel with them, and then they give them about $60 worth of food to provide for their families. And so it's opened a lot of doors already, um, and those that have come and received the gospel, they've already started Bible studies with and continue to disciple. So it's been a great ministry for them already. And so we're going to give toward that. And uh, hopefully the kids can get excited about that along with us. And we look forward to that. In the evenings, we've been going through the Psalms. And we'll be doing that again this evening. And the, the choir is going to sing a song this morning on Psalm 121. And it focuses on the strength and the goodness of God.
Turn with me, number 351 in your hymnals this morning. We're going to be focusing on thanking the Lord for our salvation, something we ought to praise Him for every day. Let's stand as we sing, number 351, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. Standing as we sing. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Lots of joy. in your hymnals, complete in the number 349. drop out, sing with just our voices on the last. Dear Savior, when before thy bar all tribes and tongues assembled are, among thy chosen will I be, at thy right hand completed me. Yea, justified, O oh blessed thought, and sanctified. Lord. 
Amen. One final song this morning, number 345. No other name, one offer of salvation to all the world made known. Caitlin McLeod is going to sing. my 
shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord, my shepherd, forever, forever, forevermore. Thank you, Caitlin. Psalm 23, I'm sure that psalm has been a great comfort to many folks this past year, talking about the good shepherd that gave his life for the sheep and has promised us that we will dwell with him forever. And so, what a wonderful psalm. Well, again, on this Father's Day, we're so thankful for our fathers and grandfathers, and, and no one's a perfect dad, and nobody uh, had a perfect dad, but we're thankful. There are many things we can learn. I know I learned much from my father just through the, uh, just the fun times he played with uh, spent with me he we played a lot of catch and different things like that with my dad and uh and uh and I, that's something i learned from him i'm i'm i i like to play that's kind of like i i guess i became a youth pastor you know i like games and like to play so i enjoyed playing with my boys and spending time with them I learned a lot from my dad from just sitting on the sports uh, on the uh, porch swing on summer evenings uh, my dad would say some things and i would say okay it sounds uh Sounds reasonable, but as I've gotten older, I said, yeah, that was more than reasonable. That was, uh, that was pretty important. So I learned a lot from him in that way. And then I learned a lot from him from just observing his life, how he loved his neighbor, how he uh, helped his neighbors up to the very end and, and cared for them and uh, just a good work ethic. So I'm, so, I'm sure many of you could share uh, about, uh, about your dads as well. Tonight in our, in, our, in our time together on the Psalms, we'll be talking about the character of God, our Heavenly Father, and... Uh, that it causes us to give thanks to him as we look at his love and all these different things. And so we're thankful for our dads. And so if you're a father here this morning, could you just stand? And it's just a small token of our appreciation as we give you a round of applause for your ministry as fathers. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. And uh, I appreciate uh, Megan, Kyle, and Mary Neary helping me out this year. And uh, there's a candy bar back there. There's a, it's either a Hershey's chocolate bar or a cookies and cream Hershey's bar that says Happy Father's Day on that. And being in the area of Hershey, we kind of know. Some of you guys might have even passed these Hershey bars out, the little things that said I'm a dad in pink or blue when you, uh, when you became a father. And so you might have passed these out here. And uh, we have that privilege and that closeness of uh, being to Hershey, Pennsylvania. And so uh, dads, men, all the men, uh, young men, uh, young men, only one, okay? Uh, don't, don't take a handful, even though you could down them pretty easy, I'm sure, uh, especially if, to wait, if you have to wait for lunch or something today. But uh, all the men, boys, you're welcome to get one of these, and they're back in the basket there. And they're in the basket. They designate uh, cookies and cream and, and Hershey's chocolate. And so uh, pick one of those up. Megan, uh, Mary, thank you for bailing me out. I just was having a hard time looking through those magazines again and uh, thinking about what useless thing we could provide for you this year. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> some, of you, some of you that are real tool guys, when we, when we give you one of those screwdrivers, you probably look at it and say, maybe I could use it as a toothpick or something. <laughs> but anyway, okay, well, uh, let me give out some gift cards here. Okay. Okay, uh, did this late at night, like 11, 30, 12 o'clock, so uh, I might tell you the value of it, okay? All right. Uh, let's see. Some of these, uh, a couple of these, I kind of know. I was going to. Uh, here was the first one. I didn't know if Rich Drinkwater was going to be here. My first one was father who most recently gave a daughter away in marriage, and so uh, uh, you know. So if I have an extra, I'll save it for Rich. Maybe. Okay. It was a good good day yesterday for the Drinkwaters and the Armstrong family. All right. Uh, okay. This one I kind of know. I think I know who's going to win this one. And it's nobody in my family. Nobody in my family. Okay. And so I'm, I'm, I'm free to do this, okay? I'm going to stand over here because I know who's, I think I know who's going to win this, okay? I need the father who has memorized the longest passage of Scripture. The father who has memorized the longest passage of Scripture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Psalm 119, brother. Is that the, is that the longest passage you've, yeah. you've memorized? All right. Roman, uh, Revelation 1 through 11? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 1 Corinthians 13? Yeah. 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 Okay. And a lot of others. Praise the Lord, right? Yeah. 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 Paul loves his word. God's word. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a verse for us today, Paul? Yeah. Give, give, give us one. Yeah. You're okay. <laughs> He'll come into my office sometime and say, Pastor, I have a verse I want to share with you. Yeah. Give us your life yeah. verse. The steps of a good man are ordered by our Lord. Okay. And he lighters in his way. Mm -hmm. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast yeah. down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Yeah. All right. Let's see. And, uh, at 26, 18, to open their eyes from open their, to open their eyes from darkness and to, uh, oh man. Come on. <laughs> Give him your life verse. First Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abound in work for the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. Brother, we love you. <laughs> That was okay, I knew that one. Is that all right? <laughs> that was good. Okay. Huh. I need the father who... Hey, how many of you dads grew up on a farm? Stand if you grew up on a farm. Let's just start there. Stand if you grew up on a farm. Okay? So I need the father... Farm and cow? Uh, I don't know, Gary. You're pushing it, buddy. Farm hand versus... Farm grew hand. Well, yeah, that's, yeah. That's Small farm. All right, farm it, farm it will work. And I, milk cows on the other farm. I thought you said farm hand, but ah. farm, farm it will work, okay? Because we're going to be talking acreage here. <laughs> Father who grew up on a farm with the most acreage, with the most acreage. Can, okay? Gary, if you're having trouble standing, you can sit. I'll still count you in, okay? All right, Father who grew up on the farm with the most acreage. Let's just go, go here, okay? But... 200. Uh, probably about 60 or 70. 60 or 70. So 200 so far. 52. 360. 360. Dave? 1,200. 1200. David? How many? 300. 300. Okay, we got it? 1,200? Big farm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this might, let's see here. Uh, father with a, with a family vehicle with the highest, highest, highest mileage on the odometer when you got rid of it. I know we're, we're kind of, you know, ballpark here, okay? In other words, family vehicle with the highest mileage on the odometer when you stopped driving it, when you got rid of it, when you left it on the side of the road, whatever it might be, or your wife forced you to get rid of it. Okay. If you think you got a chance, stand up. Can it be now? What? Can it be now? Yeah, it could be now. Okay, we're going to go real fast here. If, you've, if, if the number, if yours is lower than somebody else, just sit down. Okay, don't make, how, we don't have to keep track. Bob? 238. To anybody, 238 so far? 332. 332. Okay. Felix? 413. <laughs> 413. All right. Okay. Can the Belga family give your dad a hand? <laughs> Felix is staring him down. I told you so. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Oh, man. Not bad for 11, 30, 12 at night. All right. Uh, okay. Let's see. I'm just having some fun here. Okay. I need the father. I should save some of these for next year. I don't have to do it again. Father who worked the most months on second or third shift. Father who worked the most months. I'll give you a little time. Ballpark, I understand. 
I did months rather than years because it's probably it's going to be easier to find a winner. Well, Gary, you're making hey, move. You're you're making it tough on me. You're making it tough on me. Uh, yeah, I know. Gary would take truck trips. He would ride sleeper with another guy from here, Harrisburg to California. Make it there and back in four days, Gary? About four and three quarters. Four and three quarters. All right. What do you got, Dan? I'll say over 20 years. All right. Hold on. We'll get it now. Okay. Months now. Okay. Months working second or third shift. Gary, I can't calculate that. I don't know how to calculate that. All right. So I'm going to make a similar scan. Months working second or third shift. Well, I don't even know where to start. Let's say uh, 200 months. Anybody have 200 months working second or third shift? That would be what? How many years would that be? Four or five? That'd be five years more. 200 divided by 12 is what? Okay, let's go to... Uh, what, Rich, what do you got? 20 years working what shift? Second and third. Second and third. How many? You got 20 years? Oh, here. That solves that problem. Let's give these men a hand. Okay. And Daniel, what were you doing for those 20 years? Well, I was concierge, concierge for 13 years, night shift, taxi driving, a limo driving during the night uh, for another at least 10 years. So yeah, was, part of that he was a taxi limo driver in New York City. <laughs> okay, all right, isn't that crazy? And Rich, where were you? Kennedy Airport, Kennedy Airport loading luggage. Uh, in New York City. So good. Thank you, man. And uh, so many ways, so unique our stories and, you know, but yet uh, the common thing that's most important is the grace of God, what we have in Christ, okay? Matthew chapter 19, if you would please this morning. We're, you know, won't be too long today. Matthew chapter 19. Let's start off with just singing this, that familiar chorus, Jesus Loves the Little Children. Could you sing that with me? Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Pastor near Philadelphia wrote that little chorus and song in the early 1900s, and it's become very well known and sung just generationally since that time. We're going to look at this morning the fact that Jesus does love the little children, not just because the song itself says so, but because the Word of God says so and teaches us that as well. And so you're in Matthew chapter 19. We'll be looking at verses 13 through 15. And in this brief passage, we learn uh, in terms of of Christ's relationship to children. What type of relationship did Jesus Christ have with his children, with children? And we see that in this particular passage, but we see also as well what should our relationship to children be and to Christ because of his love for children? How should we be emulating that in our life? And so we'll just go through some meditations, you might call them, this morning, and hopefully they'll be beneficial to us in developing the proper attitude as we think of the Lord's attitude towards children, those that were young and vulnerable. Uh, and so we'll do that. To kind of summarize what we'll be looking at this morning, the first thing that is going to become evident in this passage, as I'll just mention to you what we'll be covering, we'll see parental initiative in this passage. In other words, we'll see, uh, that's kind of a short way of saying that a par uh, parents who love Jesus bring their children to him for blessing. They show initiative, okay? That is what they did when Christ was living and on earth and walking on earth. And that's what parents should still be doing today is to bring their children uh, to Jesus for blessing. Uh, if we as parents know anything about uh, the heart of Jesus, the power of Jesus to change lives and to save, uh, it should be our desire as parents to get our children to Jesus as soon as possible for his blessing, that they might know him. Uh, the second thing we'll be looking at is this uh, principle of mistaken interference. 
And we'll be looking at the disciples, or real disciples, real Peter, uh, people, Peter, James, and John, and others, and Andrew, who, who don't understand what matters to Jesus. And because they don't understand what matters to Jesus, they hinder children from coming to him. And that's what's going to happen in this narrative, that these disciples are going to hinder uh, children from coming to Jesus. And that still happens today. And so if we have the heart of Christ in our lives and we understand the mindset of Christ and, and we have his attitude towards children uh, and, and so forth, uh, then, then, then we will, will love children as well. If we don't have the mindset of Christ, if we don't understand uh, his attitude towards children, uh, then, then our interaction with children will not be uh, as Christ would have it to be. And, and we may interfere from children coming to know Jesus, just as these di disciples were interfering with that as well. And then the third thing we'll see is kingdom reality. And the simple principle here is, is that the heavenly kingdom belongs to people who are like children. The heavenly kingdom belongs to people who are like children. You know, sometimes when we look at children, and there'll be a lot of them around here this week, sometimes when we look at children, the very thing that makes us think that perhaps the child doesn't understand or, or is, is not worthy or is not worth the time is many times the very thing that qualifies that child to understand what the gospel is all about, Okay. The problem is we as adults sometimes in our, in our sophistication, in our cynicism, in our self-wisdom, we often start to lose a vision of what the gospel is really all about. We lose that vision. And then the last thing we'll see, and quickly, will be divine kindness, that, it, that Jesus blesses children. And so part of the reason that this account is given to us here in the, the Gospel of Matthew and other places is not, it's not just so that, that we can see that what happened in Jesus' life and what he experienced, but, but so we can understand what Jesus is like. That's why this passage is here, so we can understand what Jesus is like. Uh, and so if you consider yourself a child here this morning, young or old, you can be assured that Jesus loves you, that, that Jesus cares for you, that Jesus desires to bless your life. And so let's read Matthew 19 and start in verse 13 and go to 15. Then were, then were there brought unto him little children that he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. Well, first of all, in verses 13 there, the first part of verse 13 to the middle of the verse, is this parental initiative that parents who love Christ or love Jesus bring their children to him for his blessing. And the, and the point is this, that as parents or grandparents, we ought to be taking the initiative of getting our children to Jesus, of leading them to Jesus, of bringing them to Jesus. Sometimes it's easy in our culture today with our churches and with our Christian schools and, and other people that are part of our children's lives that we can surrender that parental responsibility to be the ones that point and lead our little ones to Christ. But parents who love Jesus bring or lead their children to Christ for his blessing. It says in verse 13 that these adults, we don't know, we're assuming it's the parents. In verse 13 it says, and then, then were there brought unto him little, ch and little children. We're assuming that it was the parents, the text doesn't tell us, but we're assuming that the parents brought their children to Jesus. And then it says that Jesus later laid his hands on them and blessed them and prayed. Uh, what does that mean, Jesus laid their hands on them? Well, if you look through the Old Testament and the New Testament, you see places throughout the scriptures where a father, a prophet, uh, a rabbi, somebody in some position of authority or spiritual authority would show a personal interest in a child by laying their hands upon them and, 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 and pronouncing a blessing or a prayer upon them, praying over them. You see that throughout the scriptures. And so, these parents who cared about their children, uh, and, and we as parents who care about our children, should be very desirous to, to have our, uh, our children blessed and prayed over by spiritual teachers and leaders. And some of you do that as grandparents. I know when Jessica would drop on uh, Mackenzie off to 
babysitting on Tuesday. Now that we have Mackenzie and Campbell, she has one eye or the other. But, uh, you know, when I was just Mackenzie and she'd be brought in, I'd carry her from the car into my house. I would just, she was just a little thing. She didn't know a word of English at all. But yet I'd just pause and say, God, thank you for this day, our time together. Pray that you'll give us a good day. Okay? And, and just, just praying for blessing upon our children's life. A parent's heart, a grandparent's heart, is that their prayer, their prayer is that children will have a heart that will belong to the Lord. That's what we want. Okay? Uh, could you imagine what, you know, these parents could do to remind their children over and over again that Jesus Christ himself laid his hands on them and prayed for them and, and, and blessed them? Uh, the best gift that a mom and dad can give to their children is to pray over them. To give them back to God, to, 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 to lead them to Jesus. Okay? As parents, we, we try to make sure that our, that our children are well fed, they're well clothed, they're, they're well educated, or cared for and equipped in every way so, they're, so our children can get off to a good start. We want that, don't we, as parents? Sure, we do. And we have that responsibility. But why leave out the most important reality of all? The necessity of the blessing of knowing God through Jesus Christ. We can't leave that out. Okay? You know, as parents, you and I, we, we praise the Lord for all the good and godly people that God has brought into the life of our children because I, I really need your help to rear my children and grandchildren in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I need your help. Okay? We need one another's help as a church body to do that. But for me as a parent or a grandparent to neglect the showing uh, Jesus to my children or grandchildren would be, would be the worst neglect of my life as a parent. Okay? All the people that should show them Jesus, it ought to be those that God has entrusted to rear them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It should be our top priority. Okay? So the question as parents or grandparents this morning would be, have, have you given, have I given our children or grandchildren to Jesus? Sometimes we, we tend to think of them as our own, okay? Have we given our children to Jesus? I'm not talking a, about a formal baby, baby dedication, which is fine. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not what I'm talking about. But have you in your heart and in your, in your interaction with your child given them to Christ, you give them over and do you pray for them and for God's blessing? Do you as a parent or grandparent talk to your children about Jesus? Have your children heard his word through your lips? Do you explain to them the gospel, his gospel? Do you show them in your life and character uh, the, the person of God shining out in love and joy and peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control, and long-suffering? Do you let the character of God shine out in your life to your children? <coughs> children, all right? Grown-up ones as well, okay? If you grew up and are growing up with such parents, have you forgotten to whom you truly belong? If you're growing up with parents that have given you to Jesus, are leading you to Jesus, have pointed you to Jesus, have talked to you about Jesus? Have you forgotten to whom you belong? Okay. Are you throwing off those prayers that started when you were even in the womb? Those prayers that continued even over your bed at your bedside and even continue today? Parents and grandparents praying for you and your God's blessing upon your life. Have you thrown off those prayers? Jesus cares about you. And Jesus welcomes, just as he did then, he welcomes parents or adults who, whose hearts love and break for their children and bring them to, the, to Christ for his blessing. Okay? If you've been introduced to Jesus in your childhood, if you've been introduced to Jesus in your childhood and you accepted him as your personal savior, will, will you just toss him aside as some children's toy? Just as you did with a child, as a child, you played with all these toys and you could just so easily toss it aside and move on to another interest. Will you toss them aside for the sake of pursuing your own agenda and pursuing the world's lies? Okay. Or will you serve Jesus with the strength that you've gained as you've grown up? See. Okay. 
So if you wander from Jesus, think about this, young people. If you've been brought up in a home that has taught you Christ and has led you to Christ, has, has, has shared Christ with you, if you wander from Jesus, who will introduce your children to him? I see young people that I taught many years ago. I'll see them on Facebook. And I'll observe former students not living for the Lord or maybe religiously or denominationally or theologically they've gone astray. And I see them pictured with their children. And the question that enters my mind is, is that young person that I taught that had been taught the scriptures, if they're not leading their children to Christ, who will lead their children to Christ? Young people, who will lead your children to Christ if you someday are not leading and following the Lord? See? So that is this idea of, that we have here uh, of Jesus and, and uh, that uh, parents who love Jesus bring their children to him for their blessing. Number two, secondly, we see this mistaken interference. These disciples in verse 13, it says that, uh, and the disciples rebuked them. The children, they brought them unto Jesus that he should put his hands on them and pray for them, and the disciples rebuked them. Okay? The disciples did not understand what matters to Jesus, and, and they, they hindered Jesus' children from coming to him. Now, what was a disciple? Well, the word disciple means follower, learner. In other words, these disciples, these men, they were around Christ, and Christ was teaching them, and they were learning about Christ in his word. They were listening to what the master was teaching. Uh, and so uh, that, that, that they, would, they would learn it enough that they would then start modeling it. That's what a disciple is. They learned what the master taught, and then they internalized those truths, and they tried to live out those teachings of the master, and then they tried to then teach those to other people. That's what a disciple does. He learns, he models, he then teaches to other people. Well, they had obviously not learned Jesus on this point. They didn't understand what matters to him. If you look back in Matthew 18 and the part of verse uh, chapter 19, and you look back at what the disciples were previously talking about, they were talking about some difficult stuff. They were, they were dealing with wayward brothers in Matthew 18. Okay, Wayward brothers take one or two witnesses, and if he doesn't hear you, do this. If he doesn't hear you, do this. They were talking about the kingdom of heaven. In verse 19, they're talking about divorce. And so they were talking about some pretty weighty stuff. And all of a sudden, here comes all of these little kids. Can't you see the disciples? What are they doing here? No, no, no. We're having some deep theology. We're, we're solving problems here. Okay? We're solving problems. We're, making, we're getting answers. We're having some great theological discussions. No. Get them away. Get them away. Okay? And so the disciples rebuked the people. No, don't bring them. But what did Jesus say? But Jesus said, suffer or allow little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Listen to what Mark chapter 10 verse 14 says. Mark 10 14 says, but when Jesus saw it, it says in verse 13, and they brought young children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked them, those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased he was indignant when they said get the children away we're too busy okay and so they jesus was indignant uh, that these disciples they, they should have known better they had, they had evidently forgotten the master's words recorded look back at matthew chapter 18 verses 5 and 6 what jesus had said previously and whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me but whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it was better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that they were drowned in the depth of the sea. Later in Matthew 18, verse 10, Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven there are angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. In other words, angels are always looking out over them. God cares about them. Heaven cares about these little ones. So do not hinder these little ones from coming to me. 
What was it with these disciples? Well, they, they, evidently the disciples thought that Jesus was too busy. That's what we would think is, oh, Jesus is too busy. Don't, don't disrupt him with these little, dirty little children. All right? That, he, that Jesus was too important to have time for children. But they were wrong. They were wrong. Jesus welcomes children. He blesses children. He prays for them. The reality is sometimes as adults, our Christianity becomes too sophisticated. Our Christianity becomes too elitist. Our Christianity becomes too debate-oriented. Our Christianity becomes too self-important. And what happens is we end up cutting people off that we consider to be weak or immature or simple or ignorant. We, we, we tend to then begin cutting those type of children, people off in our lives. And, and when we behave that way, folks, we are not thinking like Jesus. We're not thinking like Jesus. Because Jesus cares about the weak. Jesus cares about the immature. Jesus cares about the simple. Jesus cares about people that we would deem as ignorant people. Jesus cares about those people. He cared about me. He cared about you. If God hadn't chosen to show interest in us and reveal himself unto us, we would, know what, we would know nothing of what it means to be saved. We would just be, again, just deserving of hell as we are right now. None of us were smart enough. None of us were good enough. None of us were advanced enough to deserve a relationship with God. Okay? But God cared about us, and God cares about children. So if Jesus cares about children that way, then those that are his followers are, that his, are his disciples who are learning to live, think and live and, and care like Jesus will care about ch children as well. So let's ask ourselves some questions. Do we, do we see them? They're not on the same level as us, okay? They're down here, okay? So do we, are, are we noticing them? Do, do we see them? They're not at our eye level. They're at other levels. Do we notice them? Are we interacting? And I don't mean children, I mean young people. You know, you understand. Are we interacting with them? Are we interested in them? Are we involved with them? Are we speaking with them? Do we show them kindness? Do we, do we show them Jesus or do we block the way? There's many a child and many a childlike adult who has decided Jesus is not for them because they are turned off by those who say they represent Jesus. Are we showing them Jesus? This morning, for those of you that are children, you may be as young as five, six, or seven years of old, most of them in junior church, but young people, you may be thinking that when you grow up, you will come to Jesus. That, that serving the Lord is something in the distance. All right? Some of you are in college preparing to serve the Lord. Don't wait to do that. That's not our philosophy here. All right? You're part of the church. You're part of the body. You serve the Lord now, and many of them will be doing that in VBS this week. That's the right mentality. That's the right heart. You may be a little child this morning, but you need to come to Christ now. You need to serve Jesus now. Okay? Little children, they're old enough to know that they're sinners and they are sinners. They sin because they are sinners. And we need to tell them that only Jesus can wash away that sin and make them clean before God. And until that happens, they can't have a relationship with God. Until they're saved through faith in Christ and have that personal relationship with God, you can't then even live the life that God intended you to live. That you were created to know Him and to enjoy Him and to serve Him. But sin is in the way. Sin has separated you from God. So if you don't, if a child doesn't come to God and we don't encourage them to come to God through Christ, then, then we all are, they are left to pay for sin for themselves. And unless they trust Christ or a person trusts Christ, they will, they will pay for that sin in hell forever and never pay it. Okay. So why should you pay for it on your own or a child when Jesus has already paid for him. So we encourage our children to trust Jesus as their Savior to receive the gift of his forgiveness 
And Jesus loves the children so much and he loved the world so much that he died on the cross for our sins and for us. And so for those of us that are followers of Jesus Christ, let's not get in the way of kids coming to Jesus. This mistaken interference. Thirdly, kingdom reality. Verse 14, the end of the verse, it says, He sees us and suffer the little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. The heavenly kingdom belongs to people who are like children. He said earlier in Matthew 18, verses 3 and 4, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as a little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Again, we might have a tendency to look down on children, on what children understand and what they can and cannot do. We sometimes look down on them, but they often have a better read on what salvation is really about than adults do that are around them. Children know they can't do it. Children are willing to let Jesus do it for them. Adults don't like being at the mercy of someone else. We want to be independent. We want to do it on our own. We want to to feel like we're important. We're strong. We're smart. We've got it all figured out. And the reality is, is like a child, we have to lose that kind of blind self-confidence if we're ever going to be saved. See? The kingdom reality is heaven is for childlike people. Have you as an individual, no matter your age this morning, put childlike faith in Jesus Christ and Christ alone as your personal Savior? Except ye come as this little child and humble yourself before God. And by faith, except Christ and Christ alone, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. Have you done that this morning? If not, come as a little child, humble, broken. Trusting Christ. The last one, divine kindness in verse 15. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. Jesus blesses little children. Jesus blessed children when he was on earth. Mark tells us that he took these kids up in his arms. In Luke's account, it reveals that many of them were infants. And I'm sure some of these parents never forgot what a blessed experience it was to see Jesus, the Savior God, hold their children and bless them in prayer. So Jesus did that when he was alive, and still today Jesus blesses little ones. Isn't it amazing what a very young child picks up in terms of understanding? You ever been amazed by that? Just, I mean, how how do they pick that up? And many times they are more spiritually attuned than we can even imagine sometimes. And so we need to ask Jesus to bless our children because we know that Jesus loves children. He cares for them. It says here that he laid his hands on them, but yet he he went away. In other words, this opportunity of Jesus blessing these children was a fleeting opportunity Soon he would be on the cross. And so for the opportunity for him to bless these children was fleeting. And those of us that are adults this morning and have had children, you know it is still fleeting because children don't stay children very long, do they? They grow up fast. And so for the opportunity for God to bless our children is a very small window. It's a fleeting opportunity. It needs to be our most important task. Parents, don't waste their childhood. Let's not waste their childhood. Kids, don't delay to come to Jesus. All right? Come to him while you're a child. Let him bless you from the very beginning of your time on earth. Serve him all your days. Because knowing him and living for him is the the best life there is. Okay? And so Jesus loves children. And so uh, we need, by God's grace, to imitate that love as well this week, but every, every opportunity we have to influence that next generation for Christ. If you haven't trusted Christ as Savior, come to him as a little child and believe on him, okay? Skip, you come and close in prayer. Skip Campbell, I remember I'm asking Skip to pray because I remember many, many years ago when his son Matt was not married yet and 
kind of seeking the Lord's will. Skip, you would drive over to Matt's house or he would drive to yours every morning? Yep. Here. Five o'clock in the morning. We would pray for a whole year, asking God to show him a woman for his life. Okay. And that's what we want to be, praying with and for our children. So let's stand. You pray for dads, grandpas, children. That, uh, we would allow God to do the work in our lives and the area of sphere of life that he is to, to be faithful to him. Just before I pray, uh, I want to tell you that I was raised without a father because I was sick. my mother carried me six months in her womb when my father passed away. My dad died at 27 years old. I never knew my father, but I know my heavenly father, and that's the one that's the most important. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you most of all for Christ and what he's done for us at Calvary. For he truly was every bit God, every bit man, the God-man, slain before the foundation of the world. And Father, we pray for our, our fathers today, that they be the men that they need to be, that they would step out, that they would guide their families and guide their children and help them to love you and to serve you. We pray, Father, for our children and our grandchildren, that we might be an example to them, that we may love them, that we may serve them. We live in an age that children don't see a lot, Father, that is godly in this world. Father, I just pray that your people, your men, your servants, this nation would turn to you and love you and be the kind of men they need to be and teach the children and bless, the, bless these children, Lord. Help them to know you at an early age, to love you and serve you, and, and then go on and serve you with all passion and heart in their lives every day. Father, we ask that you bless this time today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.